My name is um, Nev Zubchevic. I'm a physiatrist at the Dean Center for Tick-Borne Illness at Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital. I'm also a physiatrist at Massachusetts General Hospital and faculty at Harvard Medical School. Um, we're spearheading this effort and very thrilled to be um, having all of you here in support and especially also the folks at the West Coast who are having a bigger hackathon today, um, which is a two-day event. Um, so I wanted to start by introducing this. Um, has actually been in the works for um, a little while um, leading up to this hackathon. So I'm going to explain if I could have the next slide, please. Um, so um, uh, what's important in, in any field is to engage all stakeholders. And uh, Lyme disease has unfortunately not had that um, since its inception. Um, and uh, we're trying to change that by bringing every um, stakeholder to the table because everybody holds a puzzle piece and hopefully if we put it all together we will have um, solved the problem of the epidemic of Lyme disease, the problems with diagnosis, treatment and prevention that we currently have um, as well as uh, rehabilitation challenges. So um, what does it mean to bring all stakeholders together and how have we done it at the Dean Center um, is that, next slide please. Um, we first went to the patients because we wanted to assess what the patients really needed because those are our consumers as, a, as any um, service um, delivering provider, um, as we are as physicians. We wanted to see what the patients need. Um, why are the patients um, suffering and how can we help? And so we started with patient support groups where we listened intently to patients and their problems and uh, tried to grasp uh, all the problems that they're facing. Um, after doing some of that analysis, uh, we were fortunate enough to be able to start a center with a, a generous donation um, where we were able to then um, design some uh, uh, actual um, events such as physician and clinician education talks uh, to better understand the perspectives of both clinicians and the academic researchers who were trying to improve the field and where they were at with their work. And then that led up to um, our own research studies, uh, which were um, targeting these problems um, to help um, get people better So, uh, on every level. So um, that is kind of how we approach this, bringing the stakeholders to the table. But that was not enough, because we felt like there had to be more communication, and we had to bring in more people to solve this massive problem. Um, Lyme disease is. Um, the CDC estimates uh, probably around 300,000, if not more, cases um, per year. Um, and with all the variable genome species, uh, that problem might be 10 times more um, that um, we don't even know. Um, Co-infections, we're not even measuring, so we don't even know the, the um, effect of those. But um, that's probably pretty significant as well, uh, all the other bacteria and viruses that the ticks are carrying when they bite somebody. Um, also, um, the big problem that we have is the issue of um, just general prevention and strategy so people can actually practice and apply the things to help themselves. So next thing, what we did was, um, next slide please, um, try to figure out what this illness looks like when it's really um, a deep into the central nervous system. So as physiatrists, um, we, we wanted to gather more data to really describe this problem on a physiological level. And that we couldn't do alone. So we partnered with specialists across the field um, to help us gather that data. And uh, one of the uh, prime specialists in the field that helped us was um, radiology. So um, Dr. Michael Larvey from Massachusetts General Hospital, who is a premier a radiologist and the director of the clinical nuclear imaging at the Mass General helped us uh, obtain PET scanning and actually designed a very um, innovative way of uh, staging the degree of um, involvement um, of Lyme disease in the patient's brain and the degree to which the brain has been impacted by this disease, which helped us tremendously clinically. And so on this slide, you can see what a very affected PET scan looks like in a patient who's suffering from Lyme disease. Um, this helps us in um, treatment monitoring and treatment response and um, planning um, of therapy. Next slide. Um, so then we engaged outside of our institution. So we said, our, this is what we're learning in our institution. This is how we're quantifying uh, the disease process and pathophysiology. But we need help of other institutions and see what people are doing um, across the world and, and 
um, in different um, academic and clinical centers. So we had reached out to Columbia Lyme Center, to Johns Hopkins Lyme Center, um, and also to Stanford's Lyme Working Group, um, which are the biggest institutions working clinically and with patients trying to help these folks. And we have um, formed an informal consortium where we help advise each other and try to um, uh, tee up our research studies and needs and help each other um, uh, promote each other's work and improve it. Um, so we then together also started developing clinical instruments to help quantify this disease symptomatology better. Um, we then involved more patients, so anytime that we uh, develop a tool, we run it through a bunch of the clinicians who are um, intimately engaged in helping the patients, and also, um, you know, we, we discussed this with patient representatives to get their opinion as well. We talked to the foundations, and um, again, try to engage all the stakeholders in this process of um, collaborative effort. Next slide. So then, um, this kind of led onto even a bigger um, effort, which was um, the um, association, um, the um, uh, American Association for Advancement of Science, um, which um, Dr. Kristen Honey was a fellow of, and we had done um, and helped um, support Innovations X, which was the effort of bringing um, even more stakeholders to the, uh, to the table, uh, uh, including government agencies, the fellows from government agencies, to try to help and collaborate together and design the top 10 priorities in Lyme disease research. So what needs to change for us to actually advance the field? And over a two-day workshop in Washington, D.C. last November, we were able to design this think tank um, product, which was these uh, priorities for Lyme disease research to help propel the field forward. And um, we will share those with you now. So if you can um, uh, read these, but um, uh, they've been slightly modified uh, to help the flow of this hackathon. Uh, but how can we get people to commit to use modes of prevention? So prevention uh, is the first um, uh, theme. Uh, then we have the given indications of animal studies. How do we study other potential modes of transmission like body fluids or ingestion? Then how do we educate target populations about post-treatment Lyme disease? How do we uh, let patients know? Because frequently patients go on years um, without proper diagnosis, not even knowing that this is a possible diagnosis. Then number next is how do we help educate the providers and the patients about the clinical profile, treatment prognosis, and test options for Lyme disease? Um, because we find that providers themselves aren't quite um, clear on what's um, happening in the newest research that's coming out. Next. Um, then diagnostics. We have difficulty with diagnostics, and we need help in developing reliable, highly sensitive, and specific tests for active infectious tick-borne illnesses. Um, how can we also develop testing for Lyme and other tick-borne co-infections at all stages of infection? And how can direct molecular methods be used to identify and develop a broad diagnostic for all tick-borne agents to define the underlying cause? Um, next slide. And then treatment. Um, so there is a theory that, um, and not just the theory, but actually quite a bit of um, evidence now that, that there are persister cells involved in Lyme disease. So the question is, if persister cells are driving post-treatment Lyme disease, what is the mechanism? And does fatigue colorate with a post-treatment Lyme disease marker? Um, I don't know why this is like this, but um, we got some. You guys also have this in your packets. Uh, next. And then rehabilitation. Uh, does fatigue correlate with a post-treatment Lyme disease marker? What role does inflammatory pl uh, inflammation play, and how do we address it in treatment? And how do we rehabilitate the brain and rest of the nervous system after injury from Lyme disease? So th this is a lot of um, goals, lots of questions that we have, lots of um, unfilled need, and that's why we feel that these hackathons are really needed to bring various stakeholders again together, but on even a larger scale, and um, try to solve these uh, tremendous problems with some new thinking, some new ideas, some new approaches, and um, hopefully tackle this um, in the next couple of years um, so that all of us are a lot safer when we go to the park and sit down on the grass and don't have to worry about Lyme disease on either coast um, and in the middle. Um, and so I would like to, with that, um, hand over the stage to Wendy Adams, who run, uh, helps um, run Bayer Lyme Foundation. 
<laughs> and uh, she is a representative um, as a uh, generous uh, donor foundation that helped us enable these two hackathons and also the third um, large hackathon that will be happening June 17th through 19th here in Boston.